Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for your word and for the opportunity you've given us to come together and just think about it, talk about it, feast upon it. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts the truth that you would have us know, for we long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We have begun a new series on parables. I believe this will be part three. So I want to thank you all for your continued interest and participation in Blessed Hope Forever. I'm going to be talking about a specific parable uh, in this video, the mustard seed. And, and uh, I hope you find that encouraging, enlightening. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I want to just cover a few bases here. Uh, uh, sort of set the stage, you might say, for this. We're going to be looking at chapter 13 in Matthew. Uh, pretty heavily in this video. As I've pointed out in the past uh, concerning any one of these teaching videos, uh, we always need to ask ourselves when we read a verse or a passage of Scripture, who is the text speaking to? Who's the Holy Spirit writing to? It should be the first question that we ask. Uh, if it's Israel, uh, then the church most likely did not yet exist. And so we need to make that differentiation and look for whatever application there may be for the church. Uh, is the truth being taught applicable to the church? Because in order for it to be applicable to the church, it can't ever contradict that which pertains to the church. Uh, Paul's epistles, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, whatever writings in the New Testament uh, that we're looking at. Uh, I want to give you an example uh, uh, so that you don't really get confused here. When we look at Isaiah 53 verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I, I have a bracelet that I wear. Uh, I don't always wear it, but it's, I have it. It's, I love it. It's, it's a bracelet that says, By his stripes we are healed. I uh, also had that same verse on a, a, a small medallion that I wore on my hat. Now, uh, most Christians are familiar with that verse uh, in Isaiah, but I, I'm not sure how many understand that that verse is speaking to Israel. And so, just so you know, that even though it is speaking to Israel, there is an application there for the church because the same is true of me. By his stripes, I was healed. He was wounded for my transgressions. Now, I know it's talking to Israel, but there is an application there for the church. But strictly speaking, the context is Israel, and we want to be sure that we don't miss seeing that the direct communication uh, in the text is speaking to Israel, not the church, not some church that was yet to exist. Isaiah to, to Isaiah, the church was a mystery. Though that be the case, the, the truth of that verse absolutely does apply to you and me. But that's not always the case. Uh, another example would be, you know, for us to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Uh, that's, that's what we're told to do in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 13. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Whereas if we go over, and that was written to the church. Uh, if we go over to 
the Gospel of Luke in chapter 6, verse 37, we read, uh, forgive and you will be forgiven, and that's conditional. And of course, at the time that L the Holy Spirit wrote that through Luke, we're looking at a period of time in which the church was yet to exist. There was no church. So I want to point that out. There's a lot of uh, things that can be said about the course of this present age that we're living in. We're living in some very peculiar times. We're living in some very interesting times, especially prophetically. Uh, that age from uh, the rejection of the Messiah by Israel. And I pointed out in my last video that in, in Matthew chapters 21, 22, 23, uh, in particular, uh, uh, present Israel's rejection of their Messiah and it also outlines the God's official rejection of Israel as a nation where that he then turned his attention to the Gentiles. So that age that's from the rejection of the Messiah by Israel unto his reception by Israel at his second coming is outlined in two portions of the word. Matthew 13, and Revelation 2 and 3. And, uh, and so the, the course of this present age uh, will be traced from these two passages. Now, when we look at Matthew 13, and I, I would like for you all to follow me through this, when we look at Matthew 13, uh, verse 11 reveals that our Lord is speaking in, in order that He might give the course of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, keep in mind that Christ has arrived on the scene. He's offered Himself as King. He's offered the kingdom to Israel. There are uh, three different basic approaches to the chapter of Matthew 13. Uh, first of all, there's those who they divorce any prophetic significance whatsoever from that from this passage, uh, you know, this chapter, the, this this study, uh, and it's they look at it as it's all, as only in uh, for its spiritual or moral lessons, uh, uh, and uh, they emphasize the the unity of God's purpose from, from, from Adam, from the fall of Adam until all the way through to the eternal state. But they fail to make any distinction between God's pro program for Israel and, and His program for the church. So as a, as a result, as a consequence of them doing that, they see only church truth in, in this uh, portion of Scripture. In spite of all the contradictions that, that uh, such a, a method involves, they, they persist in it. And uh, so that, that would be uh, what you would call the non-dispensational approach. Uh, uh, you know, post-millennialism, uh, amillennialism. Now, there are those uh, in the second place who, you know, recognizing the distinction between Israel and the church, they hold that uh, this portion is, is totally just limited to God's program for Israel, and they relegate it to uh, a revelation concerning Israel in the tribulation period uh, when God's preparing them for uh, the, their coming king. Uh, that is what we would commonly refer to as ultra-dispensationalism. Uh, I don't want people to, to become confused here because I'm not an ultra-dispensationalist. I'm, I'm almost willing to suggest that there is no such thing. You're either dispensational or you're not. There's no way. It's, it's kind of like me saying, oh, I'm, I'm ultra-grace. I mean, you know, it's, grace is grace. Uh, I'm, I, there's, some of you have been forgiven, but, but then some of us have been ultra-forgiven. I mean, you just... Uh, I, I just, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the word ultra. But 
Uh, there are those in the third place who believe that uh, this portion of, in Matthew 13, it gives a, a picture of conditions on the earth in respect to the development of the kingdom program during the time of his absence from the earth. Uh, and so these parables, they, they describe the events of the entire, that entire inner advent period from the time of his rejection uh, until his return. And so such is the approach uh, to the passage uh, adopted in this series. This, that is basically the position of Blessed Hope Forever. And that gives me the opportunity now to point out to you that uh, if, you, uh, if you are of a different mind and if you don't agree with that and you have a different view, I love you anyway. We, uh, we looked a little bit at, at the, the, the use of the parabolic method of teaching. It's, uh, what I find interesting is that there seems to be a, sort of a, uh, a bit of a surprise or amazement uh, in the question, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Uh, that's the, the, uh, the tenth verse of chapter 13. Matthew 13. Now, there's, it depends on kind of how you read that. Okay, if, if, if you read it, if it's read, why speakest thou unto them, them in parables? The emphasis is on the them. Well, the question would, uh, uh, it, it raised the problem as to why the Lord would speak to the multitude as he is in, in, in Matthew uh, 13, 1 through 3. Through 3. Uh, I, I'm I'm probably better off by by trying to explain it this way. In this chapter that we're going to look at, Matthew 13, the Lord has already characterized uh, that generation, those people, His people there, as as a an evil and adulterous generation. Verse 39. So. Uh, the problem then would be, well, why do you continue to teach a nation that's publicly announced their decision that you're a son of Satan? Uh, when we look at the Lord's reply in the verses that follow, it would seem to indicate that the question ought to be understood, why speakest thou unto them in parables, with the emphasis on parables? Uh, there was nothing new in the use of parables themselves. He had, he, had, uh, he had used a lot of parables before, you know, to instruct and, and illustrate uh, the truth that he wanted to convey. I, I think the disciples must have recognized a, a, a new emphasis in our Lord's teaching method. In, in reply, because in, in reply to, to the disciples' question, the Lord gives uh, three purposes in the use of, of this parable method of instruction. It was a means of substantiating His claim as Messiah. Uh, we see that in uh, verses 34 and 35. In addition to the other signs uh, to, to prove His claim, there was the sign in relation to Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, it was a method of imparting truth to the believing hearer. We, we know that from the 11th verse of Matthew 13. And it was a method of hiding truth from the unbelieving hearer. We see that in verses 13 through 15. And uh, there was a reason why it was necessary to hide truth. The what you, I want you to really understand, folks, is the Gospel of Matthew. Because that's, this is where we're at. This is what we're looking at. Uh, pre, it presents Christ as Jehovah's King and Israel's Messiah. It, it um, more than any other of, of the Gospels. It is, uh, it's, uh, it's, 
it's just you can't read it folks without saying that it's it's line it lines up with the hebrew scriptures it's it's a uh, in 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 the way that it's written in, in the theme the tone of the language the the subjects are are is are israel uh, the messiah the law the kingdom uh the prophecy it has jewish ideas uh, jewish terms it, it just characterizes the whole the whole book of uh, matthew i don't think it's witness the matthew's witness would have really impressed the romans or the greeks all that much but it, it to the jews its significance would be inescapable so throughout the book, throughout the book of, of Matthew, Christ is seen in His presentation as Messiah. In chapters 1 and 2, His legal right to the throne is presented. In chapter 3, is depicted the dedication of the king. In chapter 4, the moral right of the king is demonstrated. In, in chapters 5 through 7, the judicial right of the king is shown and in 8 through 10, we see the authority of the king. Uh, in chapters 11 and 12, we see the opposition to the king. Okay, the opposition. So the, the great question before, before Israel was, you know, is not this the son of David? And of course, it's pretty evident when you go through reading that that uh, uh, Israel is answering in the negative. No, he's not. And Christ shows that uh, that both he and John the Baptist have have been uh, rejected, uh, and this rejection will result in judgment. If you read the last few verses of chapter eleven. And because of that rejection, uh, Christ can then give a new invitation, an invitation to all. We have to make that dispensational distinction. If, if we don't do that, folks, we'll, we'll lose ourselves in a, in a wilderness of, uh, of uh, wrong interpretation. Now, now that Israel's rejected the kingdom, uh, the question will naturally arise as, well, what will what, happen to God's kingdom program now that the kingdom's been, been rejected and the king has been uh, rejected and the king is absent? Uh, we do not want to make the, the grave error of, of of, of believing that God has abandoned or rejected His people. He had a covenant with them. It was, it's unthinkable that that covenant could ever be abandoned. Uh, and so, as we go down, continue to go down through Matthew 13, uh, we see how the, king, the term kingdom of heaven is, is used. I pointed out that's a plural. It's kingdom of the heavens. Uh, there's the spiritual kingdom. There's the earthly kingdom. Um, there's the mystery form of the kingdom. There's the millennial kingdom. And so, we'll, we continue to go down through here and we see a whole lot of parables to look at. There's a lot of parables to, to, to go over and look at. Uh, I hope to touch on the new things and old things. That's an, that's an important part of this. Um, what I'm absolutely convinced of is that chapter 12 closes with the Lord setting aside all natural relationships, uh, the covenant promises by a physical birth, and He's establishing a new relationship that's, as Paul so adamantly taught, uh, a new relationship based on 
faith. Now, and since I uh, since I've reached the age uh, to where that uh, I can't see, the, I, I couldn't see the kingdom without these. I'm going to have to have to put these on. On the same day, verse one, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Very important. The sea denotes people. He went out. It says of the house and sat by the sea. We're going to see a change in this as we go down through the chapter here where Christ repositions Himself. And I think that's of great importance. And, and great multitudes were gathered together to Him so that He got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, and here, here, here we go. Behold, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they didn't have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <coughs> what catches my attention is the, the uh, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty, and I you just got to, you got to wonder, you know, why, why isn't it some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred? Why does he go down back, you know? I'm not sure, and I'm not going to suggest dogmatically, but I'm not sure that that's not a reference to this final age of being one which is uh, the production phase of it all uh, is, uh, doesn't go up, it goes down. And it declines as we move down through the, the period of the age, but and it was after this the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And as I pointed out in a previous uh, part, that uh, it wasn't given to them. And uh, you can read verse 11 of the text, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And if you, if you don't believe in divine election, if you don't believe that believers were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that God took out a people, a nation, an entire nation of people for himself, you know, he chose a nation, and that was Israel, okay? Jesus was born as a Jew. He wasn't born as an American. He wasn't born as a Canadian or a Mexican or, or an Oriental, an Asian, a China. He wasn't born some Pacific Islander, okay? He was born a Jew because God took out a nation of people for himself. Uh, we've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's amazing to me that we see the doctrine of election in directly in verse 11 of chapter 13. Now, we can go down through these passages here uh, And we can look at all these parables. The first one's the lamp. Uh, I'm looking at all, I've got a list here of all the parables that's just in Matthew. Okay? Starts out in chapter 5. We're looking at the lamp. You are, you are the light of the world. Notice he did not say, I'd, I'd sure love it if you was the light of the world. Be nice if y'all was the light of the world. Uh, I, some of y'all are the light of the world. Some of you are not. It's not what he says. 
Isn't it amazing? He comes to his people who are basically reject him and despise him and crucify him. And he, and he says that they as a nation are, they are the light of the world. The grammar will not allow you to say anything different other than what we're, we're reading. They are. Are they today? Yes, they are. Well, Steve, he's set Israel aside in unbelief. We are the light of the world, okay? You know, it's, the church has taken Israel's place. And can we call ourselves the light of the world? Well, I believe we can. As I pointed out previously, all Scripture was written to us, but not all Scripture, or all Scripture was written for us, but not all Scripture was written to us. But is there an application for the church here? Can I tell you folks that we are the light of the world and be correct in doing so? I believe I can. But does the is the text speaking to the church? Well, of course not. There was no church in Matthew chapter 5. And, you know, I love the illustrations that the Lord uses in, the, in these parables because they're common, everyday things that people did. They, they sowed, they worked in the field, they, they made bread, they, you know, they lit lanterns, they, you know, it was, it's almost so elementary, so wonderfully simple to understand all of these parables. The, the difficulty, it's not in understanding the parable that's, that's the difficult part. The difficult part, if you want to call it that, if, if there's any difficulty to this, it's reading it and understanding it correctly in context. Context, folks. Context. And when we do that, I think we find out just uh, how much more, e how much easier it is to to do that. Of course, I would not light this and. And then put a five-gallon bucket over the over the top of it. I mean, that's. You know. But we're not looking at the lamp here in this video. Uh, neither are we looking at the speck in the log. We, we may cover that, or new cloth on old garment, or the divided kingdom, or the sower, or the weeds among the wheat, the wheat and the tear. I'm going to go ahead to the the 31st and 32nd verse, the mustard seed. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna start there. Uh, let me just take the next four parables: the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, treasure, and the pearl of great price, and just tell you what I think, and what I think is kind of worth uh, as about as much as these things are. But I it, I would like to do that. Uh, I would like to just tell you how, how I look at that, how I simply look at that, and maybe that will help. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about the leaven in, 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 uh, previously, where that the, it's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into to, you know, about 60 pounds of wheat flour until it, it all worked all through the dough. Uh, uh, if you, I refer, I'd have to refer you back to that video but basically, in a nutshell, this is the this is how the kingdom uh, uh, of of the heavens develops until it's it, it, the leaven consumes the flour. I mean, it, it over over. I, I don't know what the right word would be. It permeates the flour to the point to where that. There, there is no, you can't reverse the process. Once it's begun, it, it, it continues until it's completion, until it's all leavened. That's, that's simply uh, what the text is saying. That's what the kingdom of, of the heavens is like. And I'm, I'm going to suggest that this, this kingdom of the heavens is from the rejection of Christ, God's formal rejection of Israel, until the that whole inner advent period all the way up to the second coming of Christ, that is the kingdom of the heavens and perhaps even, I'll suggest, beyond the, uh, into the eternal state. Okay, But 
but that's that inner advent period in particular. Now, when we go back, uh, go ahead here to the hidden treasure, uh, this hidden treasure, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. Uh, we know from the text, the field is the world. We know that, that uh, the, the, the one operating here that, that's doing the action here of, of, of hiding, uh, we know that that's God. Uh, and there's a treasure. And the question is, what is the treasure? Uh, when a man found it, he hid it again. Uh, and then his joy went, and in his joy he went and sold all he had and he bought that field. I think that, that there's a progression to this. I think the hidden treasure is referring to Israel. Uh, that That is Israel, his people, that they are that treasure hidden in a field. But when we go to the pearl of great price, it's like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And uh, now you could say, well, the pearl and the treasure or synonyms, and they're both talking about the same thing, or the both are all inclusive. I'm going to suggest the hidden treasure is Israel. I'm going to suggest the pearl of great prices is, is the church, which is uh, uh, amazingly is the predominant view that I'm going to take. And so that we're going to back up now to the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, pretty small. In fact, the smallest of all seeds, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it's the smallest of all seeds, well, there's the text directly states, it directly states it's the smallest of all seeds, so I'm assuming it must be. Yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Lovely picture. So that's what I want to talk about. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to take you back to Daniel chapter 4. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 10. Thus were the visions of mine head and my bed. I saw and beheld a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He, he cried aloud, and he said thus, Cut down the tree and cut off its his branches shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth. Uh, I don't know hardly how to put this into words, people. Here you got a guy, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. He had a great kingdom. And in this dream, that God sent upon him. In this dream, he saw, not to his recognition at first, because he had to, to grab a hold of Daniel to interpret the, the dream, but he didn't understand the dream at all when the dream of this kingdom that had grown great had now suddenly collapsed and fallen in on itself and he was cast out to live, I don't know, kind of like John the Baptist, I guess, eating wild honey and locusts. And, but he ate straw like the ox. I mean, he was, uh, he was really put out. He lost everything, okay? But then it was restored. The kingdom was restored once 
Nebuchadnezzar came to realize and I've got, I, I think it's best I just go ahead and read this part. Go down to the bottom of Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar's restoration. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me. Think Israel when Christ comes. If I could back up now, I could back up and I could go back to Nebuchadnezzar's fall, the kingdom where the kingdom fell. And I think I would it would be proper to relate that to Israel's rejection of the Messiah. I don't know how much this is making sense. I I, I really pray I don't confuse people. But in my opinion, what I'm looking at, when I look at Matthew 13, this specific parable about the mustard seed, which is the kingdom starts out small, it grows until all of the nations, that's the birds that, that nest in its branches, all the nations come under the protective umbrella of Christ's rule and reign on earth during the millennium. What is so fascinating about this is try to imagine this. God, God takes someone like Neb raises up someone like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, do you think that when Nebuchadnezzar was a little baby, that he, or well, let's say a child, do you think that he could have, in his wildest imaginations, thought that he would be raised up by God, the God, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, to, to be a living example of a nation in which would reject Christ, the kingdom, both Israel rejects both the king and the kingdom. The kingdom is po age is postponed until that time of restoration, until that time in which, as Daniel does here, comes to realize, listen, listen to what he says, at the end of the days, at the end of the days, think prophetically here, Israel. I know we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, Jesus said to Israel, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And my understanding returned unto me, says Nebuchadnezzar. And I bless the Most High. That's what Israel's going to do when Christ returns. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven. All his works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he's able to abase. Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's dream Never did I would, I would I ever think that Nebuchadnezzar would have ever imagined that his whole life, his entire life, would be a tool, an instrument in the hands of God to illustrate one of the most amazing truths in all of Scripture, which is Israel's rejection, Israel's fall into unbelief, and their restoration in the final last days. Another parable, it's, it's verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It starts out small, folks. The kingdom. 
which a man took and sowed in his field. That's God sowing that, keep that seed of the kingdom. Now I have heard commentator after commentator after commentator say to me, well, that mustard seed, that's our, that's a, our faith. We plant that little, we're the ones doing the planting. That's our faith. And it grows. And man, so you know, it's all that everything's on us. You know, it's all about our faith. It's all about our sowing. It's all about, you know, we sow the seed. We, you know, and I don't see how that they can do that when the parable itself says that the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It doesn't say your faith, your personal faith in Christ, which obviously grows, I, I get that, is, is like to a grain of mustard seed. Doesn't, that's not what it says. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. I don't read my faith in this anywhere. Which a man took. That's not me. That's God. And sowed in his field. That's the world. That's not my life. The field is not my life. But when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs. And becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air, I'm going to say the nations of the earth, come and lodge in the branches thereof. That is, they, they come under the protective umbrella of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's millennial reign on earth. All the nations come under the, under the dominion of Christ, under the protection, God's people, under the protection of their Messiah, their Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that explains the parable of the mustard seed when taken and looked at in context and and it has nothing to do with our own personal life now when you go as far as faith is concerned now when you go down to the next one after that that's the parable of 11 which i did previously so now that we have this parable of the mustard seed which shows that it's it starts out small it gets great all the nations come under the leadership of it. And now we're down to the parable of the leaven, which is a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Makes perfect sense to me. It does. Makes perfect sense. And of course, then he talks about the weeds. He talks about, and, and keep in mind, some of these parables Jesus interpreted himself. We don't need, you don't need me or anyone else to interpret. You know, we don't need ourselves to try to make sense of something that Jesus himself interpreted. That's, we see that in the parable of the weeds explained, verses 36 through 43. And then it's the parable, parables of the treasure and pearl, which I, I suggest the treasure is Israel, the pearl is Christ, and then we get to the parable of the net that was cast into the sea. It gathered up every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Common everyday activity, the Lord takes and uses it as to explain a marvelous truth of the end times when the angels gather up the non-elect and leave the elect to enter the kingdom. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? He asked. They said unto him, yeah, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of, of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. 
new and old. I, I'm going to suggest it simply describes you know the old things or the old covenant, the new things or the new covenant. That's the easiest way I would I would think to to suggest that. And then the final uh, few verses of Matthew 13 is uh, Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. They were offended by him. Uh, he told them a prophet is not without honor, uh, even in his own country, in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He didn't do much there because of their unbelief. A lot of application there as far as you and I go, our lives go, and Christ living in us and working and living through us. Uh, I could say I don't do many mighty works over here because of their unbelief. I'm not going to devote, dedicate my time in trying to, uh, well, convert those who are who don't believe. And yet, strangely, last I checked, that's basically the modern theme of, of modern evangelism today. Conservative, conservative evangelicalism as a whole, its whole entire mission is to go about and, and try to do mighty works in those areas in which there's no belief, there's no faith. Many of these parables, folks, they make it absolutely clear that we were redeemed, we were born again, regenerated by nothing we did, but only by God we were sowed. You didn't sow yourself. One plants, another waters, God causes the growth. Well, I'm almost out of time this time. Here I love. I want to say I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.